I happened to go to graduate school at Brown University. Uh, I went there because my math professor had gotten a, a summer job at Brown as a, as a student sponsored by the Rockefeller family. And uh, when he got back to Birmingham Southern College where I was as a student, he said, when you go to graduate school, I said, I'm not going to graduate school. He said, yes, you are. He wanted me to go to graduate school, very much so. I want you to go to Brown. And I'd like you to work with a man named Kraus, K-R-A-U-S, Kraus, Charles A. Kraus. Well, so I was, I was 17 years old. I'd finished college and I was ready to go to graduate school. So I applied and Brown accepted me immediately. Probably just to see what this whiz kid looked like. And I, I was assigned to work with Professor Krauss. I, I, I realized I was seeing very little of him because he was spending a lot of time out of uh, Providence, Providence, Rhode Island, where the Brown University is. And he was gone a lot. And when he left, often he'd come by the university before he went to the railroad station. He usually had a big, two big grips with him, big leather, leather cases. They clanked. One of them had whiskey, I found out later. He was going to Oak Ridge, which was dry. He was delivering whiskey to the chemist at Oak Ridge against the law, but he was doing it. And the other contained samples of uranium tetrachloride, which was the feedstock for the Y-12 plant. And he was very much involved with something called Y-12. All of a sudden, the <coughs> university announced that there'd be no more training of chemists during the war. All the current students would go to work in the war somewhere. Where do you recommend? Well, you could go to the Army, you go to the Navy, you can go to Dogpatch. Dogpatch? Where's Dogpatch? Dogpatch? We can't tell you where Dogpatch is. What did they do at Dogpatch? We can't tell you that. So we all chose Dogpatch. Six of us. We left Brown in, in the beginning of 1943. No, beginning of 44. Beginning of 44. And I was assigned to the, what they call the final chemistry research lab at Y-12. And the job we had was to learn how to make clean, not contaminated uranium tetrafluoride, which was going to go to uh, Los Alamos. And there they would combine it with calcium metal and get uranium metal for the bomb. We didn't know any of that. We just knew we were jo our job was to make uranium tetrafluoride, which is what I did in Oak Ridge it, until the war ended. Uh, so dog patch was Oak Ridge. That was the code name. Y-12. Y-12 was part of Oak Ridge. K-25 was another part. S-50 was another part. But Y-12 was the big plant that Eastman ran. Huge plant that Carbide ran was, was uh, S S-50. Y-12 was a electromagnetic separation plant. Our, our product was finally converted to uranium tetrafluoride uranium-235 tetrafluoride, which then went to Los Alamos to make metal for the bomb. We didn't know anything about Los Alamos. I just knew I, I handed it to an army courier who disappeared into the night. I didn't know where he went. Some weeks into that job, my part was finished because they had a production department finished. They took over the making of it. 
and I took over a job I'd started, which was to sublime samples of uranium tetrachloride and see what, what I could collect from the sublimate. In doing that, I bought various metals, copper and iron and molybdenum, vanadium, chlorides, to see how they'd work in a sublimation apparatus. That meant I had those chemicals. After the war, they wanted to start separating isotopes of other elements. I had the elements. I had the samples. So I got a, a, started another lab for uh, so-called stable isotope chemistry. And then I went back to graduate school to where Professor Krauss was at Brown, finished there and came here to go to work. Just to list the jobs I had, I started as a chemist, was promoted to research chemist, senior research chemist, research associate, senior research associate, assistant director of research, director of research, and retired. But that, that took 40 odd years. I worked there from 19, I worked here from 1946, I guess, until uh, 1989. I worked in Oak Ridge before that. I had read that somewhere along the line, some other chemist, I don't even know his name, had been able to take a compound called dimethyl ether and add carbon monoxide to it two times. And when you do that, you get acetic anhydride. Well, I thought that was wonderful. Now, what do we want acetic anhydride for? That's the base for Eastman's acetate plastics. You take acetic anhydride and cellulose and you get a cellulose acetate, which you can dissolve in acetone and spin as chrome spun, or you can extrude it as a beautiful molding plastic. So that was that was the entree, was to, to get acetic anhydride. And it dawned on me one day that I, I could think of a simpler way of making anhydride. We made it by taking acetic acid and cracking it in furnaces to a chemical called ketene, combining the ketene with acetic acid to get acetic anhydride. That's an expensive process because it takes a lot of energy to crack the acetic acid. Well, I'd read that somebody had been able to add carbon monoxide to dimethyl ether and get acetic anhydride. It takes, you have to add two of them. And I sat right there in that little room next to this one day, and I said, what if I just wanted to add one carbon monoxide? What would I add it to? Well, I wrote it, ah, methyl acetate. So I asked the people in the lab to try methyl acetate and carbon monoxide, and lo and behold, it worked. And that was the start of Eastman's anhydride work. We make acetic and hydride today from methyl acetate. You can make methyl acetate from carbon monoxide and hydrogen. You can make those from coal. So that was the start of the coal gas project. That's how that got started. There was a man named McNally, Dr. James McNally, was trying to build a research lab. And uh, Bob Hasek had been involved already the uh, and I accepted a job with McNally as he built the research lab. It, it had about 80 people when I joined, and it, it grew to around 800 when I ran it many, many, many years later. Um, a very fine laboratory, well thought of, a lot of very good people. I was fortunate to be there and to work with them. I, I even, I, I know where he's buried, the man who took me around the first time to look for some place to live. And I remember one of the places we looked at had a dirt floor and I wouldn't accept it. And I wound up 
up on Bruce Street, which is right up there in a little place that had been built from two construction shacks stuck together and a bathroom stuck on it. And that's all I could find to live in. And, but we didn't have any children. And then so we accepted that. And finally, a big house down the street became available. We moved into it. From it, we moved to the plaza apartments. And from there, we moved to a, one of Jimmy Quillen's houses on Sherwood Road. And then from there, I built this this house. And they've enlarged it several times since. It's bigger, a lot bigger than when I built it. What's hard to see is where, where that new chemistry is. I don't know where it is. Uh, there are only so many useful chemical combinations. We've made, except in the medical field, we've probably made most of them. Um, I read the, the chemical journal regularly, and I don't see the advances that shake the world. That just isn't happening. It will, as I say, it will start to happen when we start to run out of resources, when petroleum gets very, very expensive, as it will. I think I could be in a chemical lab today and in and enjoy myself, but it would be an, as an analytical chemist. Purity of food, etc. Keep us healthy. Purity of chemical. As I said before, chemical raw materials for the physician. That's not a dead issue. It would be nice to have a, a chemical that would stop the common cold. God, think of the misery the common cold caused. Don't you think we could stop it? I think someday they'll be able to stop it.